This is what Jack showed. He showed it in an abbreviated slide. I want to go through it a little bit better for you. On the left side, when we look at um, claims and make decisions about benefit design changes, we typically look at it in what I call a silo. In fact, as late as last week, I'm working with a coalition that is working on value-based benefit design, has done the health value accelerator, and then the coalition leader, so I'm not going to tell you who it is. You're going to hear it, and I'm not going to tell you. It, the coalition leader said, now go back and see what your high-cost diseases are and your top-cost drugs. And I said, well, why would you do that? And the person said to me, well, we need to know where we're going to start. And I said, but those are silos. We don't know what's the problem, where's the engagement. We already know you have an engagement problem because we've documented that. Now, why would looking at their high-cost diseases matter? Let me take you a step further through that. We ask on the Health Value Accelerator how many people have, emer how, what's your number of emergency room visits in the last year? In one company, self-insured, self-insured about 27% fully insured, the rest is self-insured. 1,800 covered lives, my hand to God, 439 emergency room days last year. Do the math. That's one out of four, one out of five people go into the emergency room. Now, it's true. There probably is less than that. It's probably some people doing a lot of emergency room visits. But amortized across the population, that's one out of four or five, wherever you want to draw the line. So if I'm only looking at my high-cost diseases, when you go to the emergency room because you, are, um, you have a fluttering in your chest or you have um, high blood pressure but you don't know that's what it's about, but your primary diagnosis is diabetes across your chart, when they check you into the emergency room with high blood pressure, they're going to tell you it's high blood pressure, so you're never going to see it as diabetes. That's why looking at your high-cost diseases, I'm not going to tell you it's not important. I'm telling you it's not where you start. If you look at the claims, particularly around drugs, which are the most dr what, where are you spending the most amount of money on drugs? Well, I would argue, and I will show you in just a minute, that I really want you to spend more money on drugs that control diabetes because that's how we control diabetes with the lifestyle changes that you heard about earlier. Oh my gosh, I wish somebody could have heard me in 1995 when I tried to get better lifestyle inducted into the Missouri schools. And I was told, we can't afford computers, Cindy. We're not going to put phys ed back in the schools. That was heartbreaking to me. Now, the difference with the value-based benefit design is we get a focus on long-term outcomes. So in another business coalition where I got a sample report and I saw 2,000 diabetics and 5,000 people with cardiovascular disease and 1,500 work days lost, short-term disability days due to musculoskeletal, I picked, up the I picked up the phone, called the coalition director back and said, how many people is this? And he said, well, it's 2,000 plus 5. I said, no, because this was just one company. I said, no, that company is not that big. How many people is this? Well, they didn't look at that. Well, what we want to do is start with the people with the multiple risks you saw all day long. Get the risks down. Get the risks down. The more we can get the risks down, the faster we can get that first year savings. And anybody who's doing a benefits design when they go to this chief financial officer, has to show how are you going to pay for the investment that you're asking me to make? And the answer is, I'm going to take out the waste in the system. That's what we do with a value-based benefit design. Think of it this way. You all know who Warren Buffett is? So Warren Buffett buys shares of Bank of America, right? You all know about that? In case you feel badly because he might be losing um, any money. He makes $800,000 a day in interest payments. Not a bad place to be. But how does he choose where he's going to invest? Well, if you look at the stock market right now, what's the one stock that is solid and going up, the one stock sector? It's the financial community. Because globally, as I know we have bad economic times, but the banks are sitting on a lot of cash, and they're not letting go of it. So they are actually doing very well. So he looks at it and says, okay, if there's economic recovery in the United States, 
Who's going to have to fund it? Well, the United States kind of out of money. That's what we're hearing anyways. Louisiana got a lot of money? I didn't think so. I was out in Wyoming, and they were flush with money. I'm thinking we all go out to Wyoming. Holy cow. But if we're going to have to borrow some money, it's going to come, especially I live in Florida now, so we're looking for the banks to release some money for home building. So what he's saying is, which is the sector that's most likely to grow? And then he says, and where's the pain point? The pain point is on three large banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Amex, not Amex, uh, Wells Fargo, and, um, and Bank of America on the mortgage problems. Which one is most likely to grow if I invest in it? Bank of America. Now, I want you to think about that in your populations. Where are the most vulnerable people? They're the ones with the multiple risk. Now you see why we can't look in a silo called what's our high cost claims? Because I don't know how many people that is. And then which other one? By the way, there's another one. The people that had zero claims last year, you better find those people because 80% of them are your train wrecks headed right to the emergency room and inpatient this year. Those are going to be above $10,000. We've seen it over and over again. If we look at those two segments, then we look at what are their high cost claims. Now we've got a business proposition because we're no longer using a blunt instrument across the whole population. And that's when diabetes begins to come to the top. But in the first year, we've got to get hypertension under control. And so it's critical that everything that we do helps the family reduce their exposure to hypertension and build their competency with managing diabetes because diabetes is not a single person disease. It's a family. It's a community disease. Does that help you understand value-based benefit design a little better? It was never about free drugs for diabetes. And I'm the one that's been tracking the emergence, the surveys, done all of this work in showing how the market has become more sophisticated. And each and every time, by the third year, we're seeing reductions in total costs when we get prevention, wellness, and chronic care managed at a primary care level. All right, this is the emergence. In that first year, the entrant wants waste reduction. Waste reduction is I'm supposed to be taking one insulin shot every day, but I only have enough insulin to take one insulin shot every three days. That's waste. Because for every one of those prescriptions that I fill and the employer or the health plan pays for, or the government, which is your tax dollars, I'm not getting better because I'm not taking the amount of drug that will help me manage my diabetes and I'm on a short trajectory to lose a limb or to lose my eyesight or a kidney. But here's the problem. I want to play a game with y'all. How many of you have ever been to a um, high school reunion, college reunion, wedding, or even the birth of a baby, a christening, or, or bris, or anything? Anyone in this room? OK. How many of you wanted to lose weight before you went there? When did you start? When did you start? Fess up. Talk to me. When? When? I didn't hear. I hear a couple weeks. I hear one week. The reality is most of you will get organized about it 30 days before. Okay? You'll get serious about it two weeks before. And on the Monday, when the Friday is the party, you'll come to me, the fitness trainer, and say, I got to get 15 pounds off by Friday. And I start telling you, don't go to sleep, because you're going to be on the treadmill for the next eight hours in order to make that happen. Having said that, if we, can, if we know that, then when we're asking people to make these changes, they've got to be touched in a meaningful way. And that is not a, a political statement, y'all. What I mean by that is it has to be relevant to them. So telling people that they're going to lose an eyesight or a kidney or a leg two to three years from now, when are they going to get busy? Two and a half years from now. You want them busy now. So you want them to understand that every day that they spend in the emergency room is a day that they're away from their children. It's a day that they're not getting their biking if that's what they want to do. If they're a per diem employee, it's a day they're not making money. You have to make it 
to make it extremely relevant at that moment, and it cannot be a goal that goes further out than 30 days. And that has to happen for 90 days running. And then as people begin to put it inside them and make it a part of them, then you reinforce every 90 days. The people that still don't have it, you're still on a 30-day mark. This is where we begin to do personalized treatment and personalized benefit designs. And we say to folks, here's what your change is. You've got to do this now for the next 30 days. If you can do that, then we will actually keep your incentives lower. We'll take the lower out-of-pocket costs. We'll do the lower premiums. But if you don't manage it 30 day by 30 day by 30 day, then we're going to take your premiums up. And I'm seeing more and more of that. In fact, I've worked very hard with a couple of IT companies to make sure that we had that IT in place so that when I come out here and tell you this, we've got the IT to make it work. And so we do.